Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very good to see you again uh, in this uh, webinar nine session of the APSC GCS 2020. Very special year. Uh, this meeting should be held in Kyoto, but because of the uh, COVID-19, we have to change the uh, meeting to online uh, meeting. So we will have uh, no coffee break or tea break. Yeah. Uh, this session will be uh, held in 90 minutes with the moderator, Dr. Yoshihito, Yoshihiko Saito, and me, Sodi Kurifki, and with uh, five speakers, Dr. Shintaro Kinugawa, uh, Sodi Kurifki, uh, Dr. Chai Chan Dira Chanawong, Dr. Chang Wook Jin, and uh, Dr. Okumura. Okay. Uh, next, I will uh, deliver the, uh, I will give the time to Dr. Yoshiko Saito to chair the session. Please, Dr. Saito. Thank you very much. Can you see the slides? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Introduction, So uh, uh, So uh, I'm Yoshiko Saito, the co-chairman of this session. So uh, it is great honor and a pleasure to chair this session. That, that at the beginning of this session, I want to introduce the current major issue in how to fill our management. <laughs> this is my COI. And then now in many countries, aging society has come. Uh, this slide shows the changes in the population and the age distribution of Japan. As you imagine, the population of Japan was increased up to, 2000, up to 2005. It reached to about 125 million. And then it gradually decreased. In contrast to a total population, Population older than the 75, indicated by the yellow, will be increased up to 2035 and will keep the high level. <clears throat> now this, uh, this left panel showed the a number of hospitalized patients with heart failure by age and sex in Japan. Uh, these data were obtained from a J-World analysis, which is a claim database constructed by the Japanese Section Society. As shown in the figure, the number of heart failure patients are increased with age, and the highest number was observed in the, their age of 80s in the both males and the females. As the number of aged population uh, is increased, the so total number of heart failure indicated the green columns will be the increase up to 2035, and we reached about 1.3 million patients in Japan. Uh, the, uh, the problem of our aging society is not limited to Japan, but also the Asian countries. This slide shows the population pyramids of Asian countries. Japan has already become a super age, age, aging society, and Korea and Singapore are aging society. And Indonesia and Thailand and Malaysia will be become an aging society soon. In this context, the number of heart failure patients is increasing in Asian countries. Heart failure is already become a, becoming a serious issues, but it will be a more and more serious clinical and social problems in every countries. However, the age distribution and a dietary culture, but really even, even among the Asian countries. So heart failure phenotype attributed to the etiology or the comorbidities 
assumed to be uh, different among countries. I want to introduce uh, one important cohort study, Asian HF study, which enrolled uh, 6,480 patients with heart failure from 46 med uh, medical centers across like 11 regions in, on Asia. In this study, the heart failure characteristics were stratified into five subgroups or phenotypes by using a latent class analysis, a machine learning technique. So the elderly slash AF and a metabolic and a lean diabetic <coughs> phenotypes are more often in a health, health patient and a ischemic and a young phenotype well, often, uh, more often in the HEF, REF patients. Elderly slash AF and the lean DM are often in the CKD. The young phenotype has a less comorbidities. And the other four subgroups of patients have mul more multiple comorbidities with a different combination. And as you can, uh, you can see figure, subgroup frequency is varied among countries. Therefore, the more suitable managing strategies are encouraged to certain country and certain phenotypes of uh, heart failure. Moreover, uh, this is not Asia, uh, from uh, Asian countries data, but from Italy. Uh, this this show, the, uh, show that uh, multiple more commodities show the worst prognosis in the HEF-REF and hef -REF, as you know. So the, this session is focused on the how to treat a comorbidity. I think uh, there are two groups of comorbidities. One is a treatable and another is untreatable or the not easy to, treat, to be treated. Uh, treatable comorbidities consist of uh, CAD, coronary disease and AF, and diabetes mellitus and anemia and the pulmonary hypertension. And uh, untreated comorbidities consist of the CKD, chronic kidney disease, and COPD, and flail, and pH, and some of pH. So, and these comorbidities are frequently observed in the heart failure, and some of them exist on the same time. So, the, from now, we will have uh, five speakers uh, from Japan, from uh, the Indonesia, the Thailand, and Korea. And they will uh, give us uh, how to treat the, each community based on the, their thought and what a lot of evidence they have. Please enjoy their talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to move on to the next speaker. So that uh, Professor Saduki, please the chair. Okay. Okay, the next uh, speaker will be Dr. Chai Chan. Uh, Dira Chanawong, uh, please. Dr. Chanawong. Yes. Uh, excuse me a minute. Uh, can you saw my slide? Not yet. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. I'm coming. Okay. Can you see this right now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this is my disclosure. So first of all, I would like to thank the, the Japanese the Creation Society to invite and give my opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, diabetes and heart failure. And this is the topic that I will cover. I will start with the burden of heart failure in diabetes, and then pathophysiology of heart failure in diabetes, and then glycemic goal in patients with diabetes and heart failure. And I will finish with the uh, the review of glucose lowering drug and heart failure. Patient with diabetes has two to four four increased incidence of heart failure compared with non-diabetics patient. And the prevalence is even higher if they are older than 60 years old. In asymptomatic patient with diabetes, commonly have some degree of ventricular systolic and diastolic dysfunction that independent of coronary artery disease or systemic hypertension. And the independent risk factor for heart failure in patients with diabetes are glycemic control. Many studies found that each 1% increase of A1C, the risk of heart failure increased about 8 to 36%. And apart from glycemic control, 
albuminuria or impaired GFR, and also older age are also the important independent risk factor of heart failure in diabetes. This is a big study from United Kingdom, including the population of 1.9 million looking at the first presentation of cardiovascular disease during a median follow-up of five to five years, they found that peripheral artery disease is, and heart failure are the most common initial manifestation of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes. Heart failure account for 14% of the first presentation of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes. And in this study, type 2 diabetes increased the risk of first presentation of heart failure about two times when compared with non-diabetics. Among patients hospitalized for acute heart failure and also patients with chronic heart failure, the presence of diabetes when compared with non-diabetic independently associate increased risk of in hospital mortality, one year or cost mortality, and one year rehospitalization for heart failure. So this underscores the need for more effective and personalized treatment of diabetes in this particularly high-risk population. This data comes from the Medicare in the United States, comparing the five-year survival rate of diabetic patients who do not have heart failure and diabetic patients who have new developed heart failure. The increased risk of death in patients who develop heart failure is about nine times uh, compared with the one who do not have heart failure after adjusted for age, sex, and race. And this is the cross-sectional epidemiologic study from Netherlands. In total of 600 diabetic subjects older than 60 years old without known heart failure, they underwent standardized diagnostic workup, including medical history, physical examination, ECG, and echocardiography. An expert panel used the criteria of the European Society of Cardiology to diagnose heart failure. And the prevalence of undiagnosed heart failure in type 2 diabetes is more than 60 years old is about 28%. 23% are preserved ejection fraction and 5% for reduced ejection fraction. And the prevalence of undiagnosed heart failure increased steeply with age increase. This study also found that the factor that can predict undiagnosed heart failure are older age, female, obese patients, hypertension, and symptom of fatigue or dyspnea. Next, I will talk about the pathophysiology of heart failure in diabetes. Two major causes of heart failure in diabetes are myocardial ischemia, that we call ischemic cardiomyopathy, and diabetic cardiomyopathy. The diabetic cardiomyopathy defined as cardiomyopathy without obvious causes, such as coronary artery disease, hypertension, or valvular heart disease. Hyperglycemia, hyperinsulin, anemia and insulin resistance can accelerate atherosclerosis by inflammation, atherogenic dyslipidemia, endotrial dysfunction, and smooth muscle cell proliferation that leads to coronary artery disease. Left ventricular hypertrophy can cause by insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia that leads to diabetic diastolic dysfunction. Autonomic dysfunction from hyperglycemia also increases risk of cardiomyopathy. Hyperglycemia itself can activate RAS system and risk to overproduction of angiotensin II, which induces cardiac hypertrophy and fibrosis and exacerbate diastolic dysfunction. And maladaptive calcium homeostasis and endoplasmic reticular stress may also play a role in cardiomyocyte fibrosis. Lastly, the energy from diabetic heart relies heavily on free fatty acid utilization. Excess high fatty acid oxidation rate contribute to the abnormalities in energy metabolism and cardiac dysfunction. Elevated free fatty acid cause lipid accumulation in cardiomyocyte and lipotoxicity. 
Now we we'll talk about glycemic goal in patients with diabetes and heart failure. We do know that the tight glycemic control can prevent and reduce microvascular complication. Although hyperglycemia is associated with increased risk of developing heart failure, but all the randomized control trial failed to demonstrate the benefit of tight glycemic control for reduction of heart failure. Meta-analysis of RCT CVOT outcomes show that in every one kilogram of body weight increase can lead to increase the incidence of heart failure about 7.1%. Optimal glycemic target for patients with diabetes and heart failure should be individualized regarding to comorbidity burden and life expectancy and balance the benefit of lowering A1C and risk of hypoglycemia. In general, we look, suggest a target of A1C between 7 to 8% for most patients with heart failure. For patients with advanced state of heart failure or other serious comorbidity, rest stringent goals may be appropriate. Now I will review uh, the glucose lowering dust and heart failure. Let's start with metformin. Metformin was previously contraindicated in heart failure because of concern regarding to risk of practic acidosis. In this rash propensity score match observational study, compared between initiation of metformin and sulfonylurea, metformin initiation is associated with lower risk of heart failure hospitalization than sulfonylurea significantly. And data from the meta-analysis of cohort study that using metformin compared with the other anti-diabetic agent, metformin can reduce mortality compared with the control. Now we'll go to the pyrogritazone or thiazoridine dione. Randomized control trials have demonstrated that TSFD are associated with increased rate of heart failure in patients without heart failure at deadline. The mechanism of increased heart failure by TSAD is the volume expansion that caused by increased renal sodium reabsorption. There is no evidence of DP4 inhibitor provide cardiovascular benefit in CBOT study. Some DP4 inhibitor might increase the risk of hospitalization of heart failure, such as sexagriptin or allogriptin. The effect in patients with established heart failure have not been well studied, with some potentially concerned signal in mechanistic trials. GRP1 receptor agonists may reduce the risk of major adverse CV event and mortality in diabetic patients with high CV risk. Most of individual GRP1 receptor agonist trials do not show benefit of heart failure reduction, except Harmony trial that used allogriptin that showed 29% reduction of hospitalization of heart failure. And meta analysis of all GRP1 receptor agonist CV outcome study shows small significant benefit of 9% reduction of hospitalization of heart failure. SGLT2 inhibitor is the first class of glucose lowering agent demonstrated to reduce heart failure in patients with diabetes, combined with significant reduction in cardiovascular events and mortality. It is reasonable to consider SGRT to be the use as part of the prevention strategy in patients with diabetes and high risk of heart failure. Recently, DAPA heart failure is the first SGRT to inhibitor study in specific heart failure patients. This study showed that among patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, DAPA glyphosin can significantly reduce composite primary outcome, including CV death, hospitalization of heart failure, and urgent heart failure visit by 26%, regardless of the present or absence of diabetes. And the number needed to treat in this study is 21. This study also shows significant benefit with individual outcome of worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death. The potential mechanism of SGLT2 inhibitor for heart failure benefit 
mostly come from the net urases that uh, come from the reduction of tubular sodium reabsorption and leads to sodium and fluid loss. There are some study found that this CRT2 inhibitor can lead to peripheral vasodilatation that leads to afterload reduction. There are conflicting results about the last system. At the beginning, they may reduce the lanein secretion, but after long-term long usage of SGRT2 inhibitor, most studies found that both lanein and aldosterone increase. There have been studies showing that SGRT2 inhibitor can increase myocardial diastolic function by reduced left ventricular mass and improve diastolic function by echocardiogram. And SGRT2 inhibitor has been shown that can reduce epicardial adipose tissue. My ketonemia from SGRT2 inhibitor improve myocardial energy utilization. This is the summary from the American Heart Association and the Heart Failure Society of the United States. SGRT2 inhibitor is the preferred drug for patients with heart failure or that with patients with high risk with heart failures. GLP-1 receptor agonists and metformin have small potential evidence of reduced heart failure risk. TZD, sulfonylurea, and some D before inhibitors such as sexagripine and aerogripine should be avoided in patients with known heart failure. Insulin, D before inhibitor other than sexa and aerogripine have neutral effect on heart failure risk. So in conclusion, heart failure is the second most common initial presentation of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes. The prevalence of diagnosed heart failure remains high in type 2 diabetes. The percent of heart failure in patients with diabetes increased risk of death. Pathophysiology of heart failure in diabetes, including hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, and hyperinsulinemia, that leads to ischemic and diabetic cardiomyopathy. Glycemic goal should be individualized in patients with diabetes and heart failure. SGRT2 inhibitor is preferred glucose lowering duct in patients with heart failure. And GRP1 receptor agonists, insulin, and metformin are alternative drugs if SGRT2 inhibitor cannot be used. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diru Chanawong, for a very nice lecture. Uh, you have mentioned about the uh, different target of uh, A1C. Yeah. What is yes. the parameters uh, to decide uh, the target of A1C, especially in patients with the heart failure? I think the most important thing is life expectancy of the patients and also mm -hmm. the risk of hypoglycemia from the agent that we use for lowering blood glucose. If the life expectancy is very short, we are not tight control at all. And if we use the anti-diabetic agent that not cause hypoglycemia, we can bring the A1C down. But if we use sulfonylurea or insulin, that can cause hypoglycemia. So we will not tight glycemic control in these patients. So it depends on two things, the life expectancy and the drug that used for lowering blood glucose. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, very nice. Uh, so uh, in like uh, in a patient with a heart failure, a patient with a heart failure, uh, but uh, in this situation it's difficult to like uh, decide to decide the life expectancy or to predict. Uh, so which one you prefer to have a lower A1C or a little bit higher? I think right can 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 predict by the comorbidity, such as renal failure or bedridden from stroke or from other condition, not only heart failure itself. I mean, the, the other comorbidity that affect the, the life expectancy. Yes. Thank you very much. Any other question from the audience or panelists? I have one. Okay, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Jay Chen. So, the, uh, so for the diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes patients, so the, how to look for the heart failure? So it is important. So, 
So how do you check the diabetes uh, mellitus patient? Okay, uh, we will screen with the symptom first. Mm -hmm. We will ask the patient whether they are shortened or blessed or tired. Mm -hmm. That is very important that we need to check the history of this near or tired or shortened or blessed. And if we are suspected, we will refer to cardiologist to do the echocardiogram. Yes. So I think the symptom is very, very uh, important. And also we look at the risk factor. If they are older age, they have hypertension, obesity, they are trained to have more heart failure. So we, we tend to send to cardiologists to do echo more earlier than, than the other patients. Do you use the BNP or NOT pro BNP measurement in the... Uh, normally, I use that for low out. If it, um, I think that this patient don't have heart failure, I will send BNP to low out because there are many, many factors that can raise pro BNP. I use some time, but not always. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very uh, nice uh, topic and very nice lecture. And the next uh, presenter will be Dr. Chang Wook Jin from Korea, who will talk about pulmonary hypertension in, uh, in heart failure. Please, Dr. Chang Wook Jin. Thank you, Chairman. Your and, time uh, is 12 minutes. Yeah, thank you for their invitation to this nice uh, APSC and the JSC 2020. Uh, I'm, I, I would like to go to uh, Kyoto, but nowadays <laughs> Uh, we are very, I'm very sorry. And uh, uh, I have, a, uh, I have a, a talk about the uh, pulmonary hypertension in heart failure. It's a very common hemodynamic conditions and uh, it means uh, bad prognosis in the heart failure patients. This is uh, my COI and um, this is my agenda. Why uh, it, it is important in the heart failure management and uh, we needed to classify more uh, clearly classify the conditions, and uh, uh, also we can uh, think about the therapeutic perspectives now. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is uh, elevated blood pressure in pulmonary circulation, and uh, you, as you know, uh, the mean PAP pulmonary arterial pressure over the 25 measured by right side cat is a uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension. And uh, it could uh, cause the uh, RV failure. And uh, this is the, uh, the reason why there are uh, bad prognosis in heart failure patients. Uh, as you know, the classification of the pulmonary hypertension, the class uh, group one is a uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Group two is a uh, pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Uh, it, it containing the heart failure, valvular heart disease, all kind of right left heart disease, left side heart disease, and uh, group three is due to lung disease. Group four is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, we call the CTAP, and group five is uh, miscellaneous uh, multifactorial mechanisms. And also, as you know, group two pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease is the most common cause of pulmonary hypertension is uh, about uh, two thirds, about 65% is due to left heart disease. And uh, in heart failure, pulmonary hypertension is also about 40%. So it's a uh, very, very closely related in the pulmonary hypertension and heart failure. And uh, its clinical significance is uh, about the prognosis. With their uh, severe mitral regurgitation patients, uh, the, if they, uh, ha they have a pulmonary hypertension, the survival is uh, severely uh, decreased. Uh, it's very worse, to, worse, worse, uh, the worse than uh, the, with a pulmonary hypertension. And uh, also in the uh, aortic stenosis patients un undergoing TABI, TABI procedure. Also, uh, the pre-procedural pulmonary hypertension means uh, bad progn worse prognosis than without. Uh, also, in the this is echo parameters, pulmonary arterial systolic pressure by TL velocity and the RV ejection fraction. 
means the prognosis also. The pulmonary hypertension with RV dysfunction is the worst prognosis in heart failure patients. Also, these parameters also, the TAPC is the RV function and the pulmonary arteriosis pressure is, means the pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension, RV function uh, means the, uh, RV dysfunction means the worst prognosis in heart failure patients. So uh, we needed to classify more uh, clearly classified to uh, uh, about two groups in the pulmonary hypertension in heart failure. Uh, as I showed before, the left side heart disease uh, me, uh, makes the passive backward transmission of the left side filling pressures and uh, makes the uh, pulmonary hypertension this area. And uh, also uh, there is a, a superimposed component by the pulmonary vascular disease that is, uh, uh, makes uh, some other conditions. There is two points. One is a uh, passive backward transmission of pressures and uh, also intrinsic pulmonary vascular disease process. So uh, in the, uh, in the, um, in the uh, uh, pulmonary arterial uh, thickness, pulmonary arterial medial thickness, uh, then makes uh, increased uh, PVR, pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, this is a normal. And uh, in the group two pulmonary hypertension, some patients showed intima medial thickening. Uh, it means uh, just one component, backward transmission of the pressure does not make this. And uh, another thing, the superimposed pulmonary vascular disease makes the, this uh, pathologic process. So um, in the long standing heart failure, we think uh, uh, nowadays, the, in the long-standing heart failure with pulmonary hypertension makes this process. This is a, a, a pulmonary vascular remodeling process. So uh, this is a pathobiology of this, uh, these uh, conditions. And the uh, uh, simple backward transmission makes the isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. Is a, uh, uh, is a, uh, most common case, most cases are IPCPH the PVR less than three wood unit. And uh, in the medial hypertrophy and the pulmonary vascular disease process, that makes the remodeling process. It's a uh, narrowing of the pulmonary vasculature. That uh, then makes a combined pre-capillary and post-capillary pH. We call this CPC pH. It's over the uh, three wood unit. The PVR is over the three wood unit. So uh, more clearly uh, we define in the group two pulmonary hypertension, there is two types. One is isolated post-capillary. This is pulmonary capillary. This is a pulmonary vein and the post-capillary only makes IPCPH, but in the long time, long standing pulmonary hypertension makes pulmonary vascular disease remodeling process that makes a combined pre-capillary and the post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. This is IPC pH, we call it CPC pH. So uh, in the pulmonary vascular PVD, the PVR is uh, steadily increasing in the, to the end stage, but PAP is uh, decreased because cardiac output is decreased. So PVR is the most important parameters in uh, these classifications. PVR three wood unit is a very important one. So um, in the sixth world symposium of pulmonary hypertension is the biggest pulmonary hypertension meeting uh, every five years. In the 2018 sixth world symposium of pH at the time, we uh, define IPC pH, CPC pH like this. As you know, uh, mean pH 25 but in, the, in this symposium, we uh, discussion about the more early detection, for more early detection, mean PAP 20 is suggested, but not uh, containing uh, current guidelines we are discussing now. So uh, mean PAP over the 25 is current class, uh, guidelines, 25, and the primary arterial weight pressure 20, 
Uh, 15, more than 15 mean, means a group two, pulmonary attention, and the PVR less than three, IPSPH, and uh, over the uh, three is a CPSPH, we call it. And uh, uh, this uh, classification uh, is important in the prognosis also. In the pulmonary hypertension in heart failure, there is two groups. One is IPSPH, CPSPH. That is a, a significant difference in the prognosis. And uh, we are concerning about this, uh, uh, the pre this slide is uh, like a, a previous speaker slide. We are now um, uh, recently interested in the hop pep patients because there is a no specific therapy now. So in these populations, in this uh, classification is uh, uh, also important, IPSPH and the CPSPH. Please, sorry. please connect again. Uh, sorry, okay. Okay. So uh, in the hemodynamic classifications in half pep patients, also the CPCPH showed the bad prognosis. Also uh, these populations, there are, uh, this classification is effective in the half pep patients. And uh, in exercise hemodynamics, typical IPCPH showed this, and the CPCPH showed only uh, uh, the uh, uh, mean PAP is increased, the PVR is not, uh, weight pressure is not increased. So the mean PAP is low is very uh, uh, indicative of uh, intrinsic pulmonary vascular disease. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um. Sorry. And there uh, are, now uh, we are uh, uh, easily assessed by the echocardiography uh, in this category. In heart patients, we are uh, measuring uh, this uh, uh, slide, but it is not important and it is not uh, conformative. So we need a right side cat. So in the TR velocity over the 3.4, we need to uh, go to a highly suspicion of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, this 22.9 uh, and uh, 3.4, at the time, we need an echo sign. One of the, these two categories, we make uh, this uh, pulmonary artery, ventricle, and uh, IVC, uh, that uh, if the two of the three echo signs positive, high probability. So we need a right side care. So in, in half a patients also, uh, highly suggestive of pulmonary hypertension, we need a right side cap. At that time, four uh, parameters is important, mean PAP, wedge pressure, PVR. Uh, diastolic pressure gradient is also important uh, previous guidelines, but PVR is more important now. In the basically, in the therapeutic uh, strategies, uh, that is uh, uh, optimal uh, heart failure patients heart failure treatment, left heart disease treatment is a base, baseline. And uh, nowadays, that is a uh, cardio MEMS uh, that uh, uh, can measure the mean PAP. So we can control the volume status in heart failure patients. So in champion trials uh, show the uh, lesser uh, hospitalizations uh, in the heart failure patients. Also uh, effective, I think in this, uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension in heart failure patients also important. And uh, also me. the mitral clip or the Edward cardio band is a mitral valve repair is uh, uh, decreased uh, uh, LV filling pressure is also important. And uh, faster, nowadays- please. Your time is uh, up actually. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, I, I uh, it's, it's a, a late, uh, Yes, few few more slides. And uh, in pulmonary hypertension, the uh, the pH specific drugs are also used, but uh, there is a uh, not so good research now that is failed. But some uh, recently completed studies and uh, some controversies in the Sildan appeal and uh, uh, some drugs are uh, promising, but nowadays not uh, approved now. 
but uh, if this is summarized. Uh, this is in the CPCPH, some clinical studies are go, uh, going uh, there. And uh, uh, the interesting part is LV outcome, LVAD outcome. Uh, this is Columbia data uh, uh, to, uh, from the, uh, between the 2004 to 2013. That is a 20, uh, 20, 105, six patients. The, they showed uh, pre-procedural high PVR showed not so, uh, not so worst outcome. It is a, actually uh, is a comparable with the lower PVR. That means the pre elvad permanent hypertension is good sign for RV function. So in LVAD, it's good. But in the heart, these patients are uh, underwent the heart transplantations. At that time, pre-procedural pre, pre PVR, high PVR means uh, early mortality. So we thinking about, we are thinking about the, in the CPSPH or the uh, high PVR, we consider LVAD, but in the uh, heart, heart transplantations, after that, uh, the early mortality is uh, considering. So th there is uh, some ongoing trials in the uh, mass tentan, Rio Sigua, Tadalafil, uh, in the Elbad patients and the heart CPSPH patients, we are waiting for the results. So uh, we are um, in Korea, there is a Phoenix pl platform in all groups of primary hypertension are registered now. I'm the PI of this program. And uh, uh, we are considering about it in this uh, CPSPH group, we are uh, including this platform. And also East Asia, we are making the uh, East Asian Society of Primary Hypertension. We are making the uh, for the uh, biobank and the registry programs. So uh, that is uh, scientific sessions. In, uh, in a take home message, I, we need a right side cat and uh, we can clearly defined IPSPH, CPSPH, and uh, we do uh, targeted therapies. We are some ongoing trials now. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Chang, for a very comprehensive lecture on pulmonary hypertension. Uh, uh, but unluckily, we uh, don't have time to have a discussion. Maybe uh, uh, if you have any question, we can uh, send directly to Dr. Chang and maybe uh, uh, through uh, email, yeah? Time is all, brother. Shall we go to the session? The, how about the shadow we lifting? Shall we close the session? Yes, okay. yes, please. Uh. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Professor Okumula. Thank the you very much. So the, I, I want to close uh, this session. So I thank you, the, all the panelists, so the, the, uh, your good, good presentation for the contributing the uh, management of the heart failure with uh, each comorbidities. So we, we have learned too much and uh, many uh, audience will, I think many audience also enjoy the, your presentations. And unfortunately, uh, this year uh, we do not have a real uh, co conference in Kyoto. But uh, I hope that uh, we we will meet, we will see again in the next uh, next year in Japan. So, thank you very much for uh, contributing and attending the uh, uh, conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's keep it safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.